In December 2019, a virus of the genus Beta Coronavirus, having quietly evolved among bat populations, spilled over in the Wuhan seafood market. Eventually, the virus was picked up by an unsuspecting market goer whose name's been lost to history. This seemingly innocuous event set in motion a cascade of events that's led to one of the worst pandemics in modern memory. It's toppled the global economy, it's overrun hospitals, and it's instilled a sense of panic around the world. However, the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic has also spurred one of the greatest coordinations of research events the scientific community has ever seen. Scientists are collaborating and sharing data at a rate as unprecedented as the viral pandemic itself. As a biology teacher, I decided to make this set of videos to share the insights of the scientific community with my students and show that with the right approach, there's nothing we can't accomplish when we humans get together to solve a problem. This is chapter one, know your enemy. The first step in engaging a problem like this is to know what you're dealing with. In this lesson, I'm going to explain what we currently know about coronaviruses, how they infect our cells, and how they replicate in our tissues, because once you know how they normally operate, you can decide on how to block those normal operations. Now, before we talk about how the virus enters your body, let's start with some basic anatomy. This guy is an enveloped nucleocapsid, or enveloped nucleocapsid which basically means that the virus is made up of a nucleocapsid proteins arranged in a spherical shell, and then that is enveloped by a lipid membrane or a lipid bilayer. It's the same lipid bilayer that surrounds your cells. Inside this shell, the virus has a payload made up of a strand of RNA about 30,000 base pairs long. Sticking out from that nucleocapsid are all these little spike proteins, which are characteristic of the genus coronavirus. Corona is actually Latin for crown, not beer. It's actually these spike proteins that allow the virus to gain entry into your cells. But it's got to get to the right cells first. A coronavirus infects a person's airways through the mouth and nose. So the only way a person can become infected is either through direct human-to-human -human transmission, like if someone coughs or sneezes in your face, or by touching a contaminated surface and then touching your mouth or nose. Once the virus gets into your body, it needs to find a receptor site on your cells. Think of it as a docking site for the virus. Coronaviruses have been known to use a bunch of different docking sites, but it looks like the COVID-19 virus likes a receptor called angiotensin converting enzyme 2, or ACE2. These ACE2 receptor sites are actually expressed in a lot of different tissues, but the main ones that this one likes to latch onto are the ones in the bronchia and alveolar tissue, or your airway and lungs. ACE2 is an integral protein, which means it runs all the way through the membrane. The COVID-2 virus binds to the outer residues like a lock and key. However, before the door opens and allows the virus entry into the cell, the virus has to make a little sacrifice. The binding of the virus to the ACE2 receptor initiates the action of another protein called a serine protease, or it's a protein cutter who uses the amino acid serine. This protease cuts the spike protein and grabs onto one of its subunits. If you've ever read Harry Potter, it's a maneuver that's reminiscent of Wormtail cutting off his own hand to help raise the Dark Lord. Once the spike protein subunit is cleaved off, the remaining sections of the spike protein fuse to the envelope protein and the cell membrane together, allowing the viral nucleocapsid to enter your cell. At this point, it's infiltrated your cell, and it's able to unload that payload it's been carrying around, the 30,000 base pair piece of RNA that's been locked up inside the nucleocapsid. The instructions for more viruses. At nearly 30,000 base pairs long, the coronavirus genome is one of the largest in the viral kingdom. It's about 20 times as big as the influenza virus. If you're reading it from left to right, or 5' prime to 3' prime in nucleic acid language, you would run into two major protein coding regions called the open reading frame A and open reading frame B, or ORF1A and ORF1B. Then you would run into the spike, envelope, and membrane glycoprotein genes. These are the genes that make up the outer capsid. And then you'd run into a few other interspersed ORFs. It actually almost seems kind of puny compared to our 3 billion base pair long genome, and while it may only encode a handful of genes as we know them, it can actually make dozens of different proteins using some really wild and crazy virus tricks. So when the virus enters your cell, when the viral RNA comes out, it's actually disguised as eukaryotic RNA, and it has a 5' prime cap and a polyadenylated tail. So when it comes into your cell, your ribosomes are like, oh hey, I should make a protein out of this, and they do. 
but secretly the virus is like, psych, now you're mine, sucker. So the ribosome just starts going along and translating that first open reading frame in the sequence, 1A. As we know from our basic biology, ribosomes read RNA in groups of three letters called codons. Each codon codes for one specific amino acid. And when the chain is complete, the protein is formed. So when the ribosome is done with the first ORF, the protein is released. Then, and this is where it starts to get weird, the ribosome runs into a coding sequence that forces it to turn around and read the same ORF again, this time offset by one base pair. It would be like if I told you to read the words by T2. And once you got to the period, I told you to go back and read the letters in groups of three, but eliminate the B. You would then read it, yet, eat, oo. For this, neither of these sentences make sense, but when the virus translates the negative one base frame shift version of the ORF, it bypasses the old stopping point and also transcribes a second protein forming the 1AB protein. It's truly an incredible way to double the amount of information coded in a single strand of mRNA. Now it gets even weirder though, because at this point, the 1A and 1AB polyproteins are auto-digested, meaning they break themselves down into smaller pieces, into 27 individual non-structural proteins, or NSPs. These NSPs relocalize and reassemble near the nucleus of your cell and form a big complex called the replication transcription complex. The replication transcription complex is the virus's self-assembly factory. While its main job is, you guessed it, replication and transcription, all these proteins here are used for a lot of different jobs. Some of them are proteases, and some of them actually intercept interferon signals from your nucleus. More on that in later videos. Everybody doing okay so far? It's a lot, I know. You're doing great. Okay, quick pop quiz before we go on. Imagine I had a strand of RNA with the bases A-A-U-G-G-C-U-U-A. How can I make an exact copy of it? You'd have to make a complement of it first, right? U-U-A-C-C-G-A-A-U. And then you'd have to make a complement of your complement, right? In this case, the first complement is called the negative strand. Think of it kind of like negative film. The replication transcription complex first produces a negative of the whole viral genome. This negative strand can then be used to generate a positive or exact copy of the mRNAs for all of the structural proteins, the spike and the envelope and membrane glycoproteins, which then go and embed themselves in your cell membrane. At the same time, the negative strand is also used to make positive strands of the whole viral genome. So right now, the replication transcription complex is doing two things at the same time. It's producing mRNA for the structural pieces of the virus, and it's also producing copies of the viral genome. This all continues for a while. At a certain point, your cell is producing so much viral RNA that the majority of your RNA stops getting processed. As the positive strands of the virus get formed, they attract nucleocapsid proteins towards themselves and start to wrap themselves up. Once assembled, the nucleocapsid migrates to your cell membrane, which remember contains the S, E, and M proteins, and wraps itself up. That's right, the virus even steals your membranes. What a jerk. As the virus buds out of your cells, the process continues in all of the neighboring cells. And so the exponential increase in viral load begins. When you start to show symptoms and begin coughing, you are sending billions and billions of these little virons out to go begin the cycle again. Pretty cool, right? We're not ready to start talking about fighting this enemy yet. In The Art of War, Sun Tzu famously wrote, if you know your enemy and you know yourself, you will win every battle. So in the next chapter, we will learn about ourself and our response to this enemy. Until next time, stay calm, stay home, and wash your hands.